All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Thank you all so much for joining us. If you are in St. Louis or the surrounding most of the Midwest, uh, thank you for joining us in the midst of this snowstorm. Tonight, I am super excited for the program. This is Left Bank Books and Operation Food Search. Welcome author of the best-selling Good and Cheap, Leanne Brown, who will discuss her highly anticipated new book, Good Enough, a cookbook embracing the joys of imperfection and practicing self-care in the kitchen. And tonight, Brown will be in conversation with Community Nutrition Coordinator for Operation Food Search, Rachel Donahue. Left Bank Books is St. Louis's oldest independent bookstore. We would like to thank all of our supporters, the supporters of Leanne and Operation Food Search, and everyone for their outpouring of love for our bookstore. We offer in-store shopping, curbside pickup, and delivery to anywhere in the country, anywhere in the world. We are very happy to be able to bring our event series virtual. We believe that events are a way to expand your mind and bring in new thoughts to make the world a better place. We hope that you enjoy this event, and we hope that you support Left Bank Books by purchasing a signed copy for you or for your friends at left-bank.com. I will share a link in the comments in just a moment as to how you can buy a copy of that book. Purchasing a copy of the book from Left Bank Books allows us to keep our bookstore and staff operating. So thank you for your support. Of incredibly special note, tonight, well, actually for the rest of the year. So if you buy a copy tonight, if you buy a co another copy in March, April, May, June, whenever you buy this book for the next year, for every copy of Good Enough, a cookbook purchased through Left Bank Books, the publisher, Workman Publishing, will donate a copy of Good and Cheap, one of my favorite cookbooks of all time, to Operation Food Search to assist with nutritional education. And I'm certain that we are going to talk a little bit more about the nutritional education program. I am thrilled that this is an offer. If you also, if you want to buy a copy of Good and Cheap, from Left Bank Books, you can just say, donate this to, to Operation Food Search, and we will be more than happy to get a copy of that book to them as well. So whatever you want to do, people are incredibly kind, and you watching are probably also incredibly kind, I am certain. So if you want to donate a copy of either one of these books to Operation Food Search, we will be more than happy to get it to them as well. I am Shane Mullen. I'm the events coordinator for Left Bank Books. I help produce our hundreds of author events each year with a fantastic team here in St. Louis, snowy St. Louis. We will be taking questions from you, the audience, at the end of the event, so you can type your questions as a comment, and you can do that at any point in time throughout the event. If you want to let us know where you're uh, watching from, let us know if there's snow on the ground where you are. And be sure to follow Left Bank Books on Facebook and YouTube to be notified about all of our fantastic virtual events. And now, about tonight's book, Good Enough, a Cookbook. Good Enough is a cookbook, but it's, a, it's as much about the healing process of cooking as it is about delicious recipes. It's about acknowledging the fears and anxieties many of us have when we get in the kitchen, then learning to let them go in the sensory experience of working with food. It's about slowing down, honoring the beautiful act of feeding yourself and your loved ones, and releasing the worries about whether what you've made is good enough. It is. A generous mix of essays, stories, and nearly 100 dazzling recipes, Good Enough is a deeply personal cookbook. Its subject is more than smoky honey, shrimp tacos with spicy fennel slaw, or sticky toffee cookies. Ultimately, it's about learning to love and accept yourself in and out of the kitchen. Gina Hamshaw, the author of Power Plates and the Full Helping blog says, good enough is a cookbook full of tried and true, approachable and craveable recipes that will encourage even the most harried home cooks to enter their kitchens. But it's more than that. It's also a personal moving meditation on the importance of self-care and self-nourishment through life's difficult times. Most of all, it's a testament to the life-changing power of radical acceptance. And now about our speakers this evening. Leanne Brown, 
wrote Good and Cheap as the capstone for her master's in food studies from New York University. She and her husband live in New York City. And tonight, Leanne will be in conversation with Rachel Donahue. Rachel is, at, or as the Community Nutrition Coordinator, Rachel coordinates and teaches Operation Food Chef, or I'm sorry, teaches Operation Chef and Cooking Matter classes to community members. Additionally, she develops internal and external wellness programs, coordinates all nutrition education with partner agencies, and develops nutrition education for social media. Rachel enjoys growing food in her garden when she isn't in the office. Additionally, she loves exercising, reading, traveling, and spending lots of time with her six kids and husband. Rachel says, I'm passionate about teaching and working with people on how to grow their own food, cook, and enjoy food. Everyone deserves fresh, healthy food and should have access to it. I am thrilled for this conversation. I think this is going to be amazing. So now, if everyone would help me welcome our guests for the evening, Leanne Brown and Rachel Donahue for Left Bank Books and Operation Food Search, help me give them a giant round of, round of applause. Oh, hello. <laughs> oh. Hi. <laughs> So lovely to be here. This is exciting. I'm Thank you, Leanne. So, so much for being here. Uh, so I want to say, first off, if you, if everyone watching has not seen a copy of Good and Cheap or the brand new, which I can understand if they haven't seen a copy of Good <laughs> Enough, because it is very, very new. But I hope that they have looked at the pictures on our website of some sneak peeks from Good Enough and have fallen in love with this cookbook as much as Rachel and I have. <laughs> and I'm thrilled for this conversation. I know our audience is as well. So we're going to start tonight with a little reading from Leanne. Sure. Rachel, was there anything in particular you thought I should read just that might lead into our conversation well, or I could pick something? So I love the story about Harry, the dad, with the grilled cheese. Oh, yes. Oh, sure. I, I love that story. I'd love to do that one. I haven't gotten to read that one yet. That would be really fun. Here it is. Harry's grilled cheese. All right. Normal looks different to everyone. When I was a teenager, I was always amazed by how different my friends' households were compared to mine. Who was around, what they ate, the way it smelled and sounded. Being in someone else's home felt intimate. And as a self-conscious teenager dying to be liked, I found it uncomfortable until I could figure out how to fit in. I was always worried about doing the wrong thing. Visiting someone else's home felt like visiting another country. You might know your friend from school, but once in their home, there was a whole other world of information to process. It was an opportunity to see other ways to be a person. And I'll never forget Matt's dad's grilled cheese sandwich. Matt is one of my dearest friends to this day. His house was calm and his parents were often home, but usually off in other rooms doing their own thing. No pets. Sometimes you could hear classical music playing or TV sounds from another room. It made me feel at peace. Or at least as peaceful as a squirrely kid like me, always worried about losing approval, could ever be. One evening, we were in the kitchen scrounging up some dinner when Matt's dad, Harry, came down the stairs. Now, I fully admit that I was not paying much attention to what he was doing because I was too busy doing my usual self-conscious routine of trying to ignore him while trying not to do anything too weird in front of him. He started slowly and carefully taking out ingredients and utensils from the cupboard, a cheese grater, a wine glass, cheese, bread. When he finally caught my full attention, he was standing by a little pile of shredded cheese with three or four little blocks out on the cutting board, bread slices buttered, holding a glass of red wine. He swirled the wine, sniffed it, and took a sip and a deep, contented breath. He was making a grilled cheese sandwich. Surely this was not how you make a grilled cheese sandwich. Grilled cheese was something you made late at night when your parents had gone to bed. For grilled cheese, you slice the cheese or you take it out of its plastic coating and simply drape it over bread in a hot pan. You get it done so you can eat it. You don't pour yourself a glass of wine and have a good time. Harry piled his buttered bread high with the shredded cheese blend. He slowly walked over to the stove and pressed the sandwich into the pan while taking another slow sip of wine. All the while chatting to us about the play we were ostensibly working on, you know, like a normal pleasant person. 
I'm sure I hiccuped a few sentences out while trying to process the miracle that was occurring in front of me. I was hypnotized, but unable to voice what felt so significant. Harry sliced his perfectly golden grilled cheese into triangles, gently nestled them onto his plate, and raised his glass of wine to us before heading back up the stairs. After he left, I turned to Matt and said, probably unable to keep the reverence out of my voice, wow, does your dad always make grilled cheese like that? He replied with the indifference of familiarity, oh yeah, that's my dad. It's the little things. He used more than one cheese. He shredded the cheese. Now I shred cheese for my grilled cheese every time. You get better cheese distribution that way. And if you use more than one cheese, you get a mixture in each bite. You can pile in more and mix scallions or bits of chili into it. That is what cooking is to me and why I love it. It's about engaging with our food joyfully to make it just right for you or the person you're making it for. It's all about attitude. You can have that gorgeous kind of pleasure with even the most simple meals, like grilled cheese. Silly as it may seem, that grilled cheese making process spoke to me in a way that was deep and powerful. I needed it in my life. The idea that such a simple act could be done with such pleasure and joy and beauty spoke to my soul. In fact, Harry's example that day may have been what set me on the path that I'm on now. He gave me the power to notice how the simplest everyday meals can be made special and beautiful depending on how you engage with them. One of the most common sentiments I hear is, I live alone so I don't cook, or it's just me now so I don't bother cooking anymore. And people say this to me like it's a simple fact, like they just told me they are lactose intolerant so they switched to oat milk. Basically, they're telling me that cooking is something you do only for other people. That it is a show to be put on. That if none of us had people to impress, we would simply eat crackers dipped in peanut butter for every meal, crumbs collecting on our chins and chests. Harry's example is exactly why this idea of cooking only for others has always felt off to me, and why I think seeing Harry make that grilled cheese struck me with such force. He had to eat, and he chose to slow down and scrape every bit of pleasure he could out of the opportunity. Thank you, Harry. <laughs> so that's... That's it. <laughs> that is my favorite story out of the book. I can just relate to Harry so much. Oh, I love I find, that you do. Yeah, yes. I find myself uh, when I go to make dinner at night that I too get that glass of wine out yes. and slow and calm down and just kind of zone out and make my food. So I'm so I just, glad you do that. It's such a beautiful thing. And it really, like as a teenager, I was just like, you can do that. You don't have to be stressed and running around or That's right. doing it for pure utility, which is, you know, what had sort of been modeled to me and what I'd seen around. And yeah, it just was like, yes, I need this. <laughs> yes. And I like the point that you make about having a friend at school and, mm -hmm. you know, you see one version of them, but coming in their home, it becomes so much more of an intimate experience. And that really, to me, is what cooking and eating is about it's very intimate um yeah, and you so much yeah. about someone from eating with them and and seeing the way they really when you invite someone into your home you're kind of showing them like how you operate like this is these are my norms you know and we react to that and i think i do think there's something heightened about that like as a as a kid when you've been exposed kind of to to fewer people and places and things and hopefully <laughs> as an adult um that those things can be really sort of, um, they can feel really revelatory. Well, in the spirit of that intimate nature, we're going to do some rapid fire questions. Okay. Sounds great. One, including Doritos, because Ooh. I too am a fan of the Doritos. Love them. So first question, Doritos. So the first thought that comes to your mind, nacho cheese or Cool Ranch? Nacho cheese. Nacho cheese. Yeah. Guacamole or salsa? Oh, guacamole. That's very <laughs> hard. It is hard. Oh. <laughs> right. I'm with you there. Mother. This one's controversial. Crunchy or smooth peanut butter? Ooh, I think they're both. I like to have both. Um, I kind of like smooth usually like for making peanut butter cookies, um, but then I like crunchy like in a sandwich. I like the texture. Yeah. Vodka or tequila? 
Again, I mean, they're both good in different situations. <laughs> That's a hard one. Yeah. <laughs> this shouldn't be hard, I don't think. Coffee or tea? Coffee. Yeah. Although I love tea as well, but it's like coffee is my sort of morning ritual and I absolutely love it. And tea, tea, yeah, I have more like herbal, more of an herbal tea in the evening kind of gal. Winter or summer? Fall, but <laughs> summer, I guess, because we're in the winter now. And yes. honestly, it's kind of rough. I mean, there's something so beautiful. If winter could be like two weeks, great. But it's not, is it? It's a lot longer than that. <laughs> it yes. goes on just too long. <laughs> yes, it is. Julia Childs or Martha Stewart? Oh, well, I mean, I hate to do this to Martha, but definitely Julia Child, I think for many reasons, but one of the biggest ones was I think the way that uh, Julia modeled the sort of realness of cooking. Um, whereas I think, you know, maybe not so much anymore, but Martha Stewart, in, at least in the past, it's very much been about like perfection and sort of rules to impress others. And I think there's a little bit too much of that in our world. And mm -hmm. there's something to the sort of joyous bravery of Julia Child and her way of sort of going, well, I made a mistake. Well, that happens. That's part of the fun. And I think that that's an attitude that we need more of. Yes. Agreed. Uh, favorite meal you've made? That's a hard one. You know, I don't know that I could ever choose. And I don't say that just to, to sort of be cagey, but really because I don't repeat a lot of meals. I, I like, I have a tendency to kind of make, um, make a lot of things like just slightly differently all the time. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm trying to think of like something recently. I mean, it's also been the last couple of years. I have to like so many, I'm just feel a little bit under, I feel uninspired to be perfectly honest in the kitchen. There's been so much, it's hard when you can't kind of go out and engage with the world um, and be exposed to new and different things. It can be, it, I've, I've felt kind of stuck in a rut, to be honest, in terms of my cooking and maybe also the age of my my child too. It's like she's at, she's four and it's like, you know, not hard to feed her, but just she has a limited range of things that she's interested yeah. in eating. Um, and that makes it, yeah, so that I, I haven't been branching out and making as many things that I feel excited about. Um, I made cinnamon rolls a couple weeks, weeks ago. That was really fun. Um, I made a great broccoli cheddar soup earlier in the week. I mean, I cook all the time. Yeah. It's, it's, it's such a sort of normal part of my life that it feels really difficult to choose. Is there one that really sticks out for you, Rachel? I know that I'm probably not supposed to do that, but I'm so no, I, I, I don't, I don't know that there is, um, maybe, actually more of a moment than a meal. Mm -hmm. um, definitely probably when my grandma taught me to make anything because mm -hmm. her food was just so good and simple and that shared experience with her. But I'm yeah. with you. I can't, I can't choose one. Um, maybe a Thomas Keller recipe, actually. It was his hamburgers, third to die for. Very simple, but so good. Yeah. And it's Thomas Keller. I mean, come on. Um, so yeah. A simple there, recipe? Amazing. Yes. <laughs> there, yeah, his ad hoc cookbook. Oh, yes. Or yeah. I should say. But, I think there's yes. a lemon tar from there that I really love from that cookbook that I thought was very special, too. Yeah, it's a yeah. great cookbook. It is a great cookbook, as, as yours is as well. So this one, I think, is easier. Biggest cooking disaster. <laughs> I don't know that I can think of the biggest one. But I find the hardest thing for me is when I make mistakes when I'm cooking at other people's houses for them. I think that's the one that I find the most like. I remember quite recently it was for a friend's um, daughter's birthday, and I and we were making the birthday cake together, and I was like oh, I'll make the cream cheese frosting from, you know, I have a good recipe actually from my new book. I'll just put it together. And it wasn't like a disaster, but it just came out soupy because we, 
bought like it wasn't Philadelphia cream cheese, which occasionally in certain kinds of weather like makes a difference. Baking is so frustrating sometimes. <laughs> like a small Agreed. <laughs> and it was still delicious and it was fine, but it like it didn't have the lovely texture. It was like kind of soupy and I had to add more sugar. And I just felt I had to be with myself that I was like, gosh, it's really there's something about my like identity that is bound up here and like being really good at making like making this cake effortlessly and making it seem as though um it's going to be and you know this is my recipe and like it didn't turn out like at this it just felt like it was so many things that just made me feel like oh my god he's gonna think i'm like a fraud and terrible and it was just like none of that is true in fact it's like so human and so normal and um real and really that is honestly like that's what i want to that's like my biggest message that i have for this frankly for this cookbook is all about like giving yourself grace with moments like that and not over identifying with mistakes and with things that are just completely out of your control like that um so that one so i i'm sharing that one because i it felt like a big deal to me and yet i was also able to kind of like truly laugh it off and uh and of course we were like thrilled with it in the end and um but yeah it's just sometimes other people's I think for me the hardest is when I'm really trying to make something to perform in some way for others like it needs to look a certain way that's when I feel the most pressure and um and worry about what others think and uh and then I have to sort of accept and sort of like, I really care um, what other people think. Um, I want them to like it. And, but not everyone is always going to like what you make. And, um, and that's okay. That doesn't actually mean anything about like me or you, right? It's just like one thing. Yeah. Your cookbook was so well-named, good enough. That message definitely was pervasive throughout the book, as was self-care. Um, so what inspired the idea of self-care in this cookbook? Obviously, we are and were in the middle of a pandemic. Yeah. So mm -hmm. that, you know, can hold different meanings to so many people. But uh, what does that yeah. mean to you? Well, you know, it's funny. It It's come out sort of at this time in our, like, rounding on two years in this pandemic but it's funny i actually handed in my for my manuscript just before um in january of 2020 um so i, I really had the idea for the or did most of it before any of this happened and and well and we like added in a little bit of extra stuff sort of to be re relevant to the um to the pandemic but i really think you know we just all need these messages of self self care but really more deeply than that i think self compassion you know i think that's something that with my last book good and cheap it was this sort of really surprise like it was a pretty big success and i was sort of new to um this kind of work and i felt very swept up in the experience and it was wonderful and also kind of scary and i found myself talking to so many people um from different from different backgrounds, different experiences. And I noticed, I really just noticed this common thread that was, you know, I was coming from this place of like, let's focus on, or not focus on, but cost is this big um, sort of barrier for many people eating, um, cooking, but eating, feeding their bodies the way that they might want to, that this is sort of one of the biggest barriers. And then time is another barrier that's often discussed. But I just felt in talking to so many people that there was something actually much, much deeper um, that was really common, which was frankly like low self-worth. And so many people would come up to me like at cooking events and be like, I'm a terrible cook. You can't possibly help me. And like say things like that to me. And it was always very revealing and interesting conversation because I would be like, tell me why, like, what makes you a bad cook? Like, what does that mean? And most of the time, truly the vast majority of the time, it was something really innocuous. Like they'd say, oh, you know, my kid often rejects my food. It's like, yeah, <laughs> of course. <laughs> Welcome to the club. <laughs> or, yeah, exactly. Or um, one of the ones that really broke my heart was often, you know, someone told me I was a bad cook once, or, you know, someone came over and they didn't like my food. And so often it's about this sort of reflection of, Basically, I realized like so many people are believing themselves to be bad at something, which it's like, it really is good 
for our lives for us to be able to make peace with feeding ourselves in one way or another it doesn't mean that everyone has to like fall in love with cooking you know the way that um i think you and i probably have rachel but i think to make our peace with it so that it's not something that we dread or that we worry about or that we feel guilty about because i think a lot of a lot of folks feel really guilty that they don't like it more or that they're not doing it in some sort of idealized way and the thing about that is it just costs so much it might sound silly or trite to sort of talk about like this causes suffering, but it does because it's a, even if it's a small suffering, it's a small suffering like every day because this really is something that we do all the time. And so if you're believing yourself to be bad at something, it's really hard to learn and grow. And, you know, in the Harry's Grilled Cheese essay and um, so much of what is beautiful about cooking is being in it, you know, having your glass of wine or just like taking, in my case, like really just taking deep breaths and trying to be with really what I'm doing. Like feel it, like listen to the bubbles of the pasta water and like yeah. hear the sound of the knife chop, chop, chopping. And, um, you know, you cut a lemon and a little bit of the the lemon juice squirts out and you can smell it. And then you can also like feel it on your cuticle and it like kind of hurt, like all of that stuff is so healing it really is if you can just be with it and it's next to impossible to be with it and to enjoy or even if you don't enjoy it just to be with like the sort of rhythms of life the like being in your body being there moment when you're so worried about what the outcome is going to be if you're always judging yourself by like it has to be delicious it has to be healthy in these frankly often nebulous ways <laughs> that are always changing um, it has to be this, it has to be that, it has to be cheap. It has, to, when you're putting all that pressure on yourself, you lose track of all the other sort of ways that you're winning. Like, and the thing is, it's just not, it's just not realistic. Like our cooking, the home cooking as is so different from restaurant cooking, from like cooking for a magazine, from like cooking for Instagram, all these sorts of ways that I think we often learn uh, to cook from or compare ourselves to. It's like, cooking happens and we need to feed our bodies every day, no matter what's going on. And our lives are changing all the time. They are messy. They are difficult. They've been incredibly difficult the last few years, mm -hmm. no matter how good you've had it. Um, things have been difficult and they have changed. And that is hard. And I think when we think, Oh, I need to like get myself back on track. Like I have to be eating this specific way, or I'm like not being a good adult or I'm not being a good whatever. It's like, you know what? Some days, it's really good to just like eat hummus and carrot sticks from the tub. Like, and you shouldn't f have to feel like the thing is, if I could reframe that, not just from like, it's okay, but actually, no, that was a good choice for you some days. Like some days, if that saved you having to do the dishes, if you nourished yourself that way and you got yourself off to the next thing um, and it made it simple for yourself, that was such a good choice. And like, I'm proud of you. And that's such a good thing to do. But instead it's always like, oh, that was pathetic. And I'm a, like all of that. All those are the feelings that come out. Certainly they do for me. And certainly that's the way that um, things like that are often char characterized, you know, in any kind of media, it would be like, Oh yeah, that's bad. And embarrassing. It's like, there's nothing wrong with that. And I, so I just want to be, I think maybe off the heels of, good and cheap, which was so much about making the most out of what you have and, and having, you know, hope and, and, and knowing that there's more that can be done, not that you have to, but that there's more possibility that I also wanted to say, like, it's also really, really okay to do less more of the time and to, to find your own way and to do things in your own style and that that's winning and that like, that's important. You know. I, I totally agree with that. We see that too with um, the individuals that we work with, uh, the um, stigma behind yeah. cooking and getting in the kitchen and the fear and um, so much fear and so much, so, much, and I think so much of that is from having like a big judge, like up here. Mm -hmm. It's not even like really, I mean, sometimes it is out there. I mean, that's a thing a lot of people are having to navigate spaces that are not welcoming and where people can use like stigmatizing language or be unfair or, you know, mean spirited. And that's real. But at the same time, I think a lot of it is this sort of internalized thing. Like, you know, I've talked to people who are like, 
want to learn how to cook, but it's like when they try to like chop an onion just by themselves, they're like, Ugh! like there's this mean voice going like, you loser, you're 27 years old, you still don't know how to chop an onion, what's the matter with you? And it's just like, hmm. that like, it's funny because I think, I think we can all laugh at it because we all have that voice, but like, I would never ever talk to anyone I love that way. I would never talk to anyone that way, even like someone who was really rude to me, right? Like, yes. I'd want to be encouraging. And because um, anytime we try something new, anytime we, and for many people, cooking is a new skill. It is not something that they were lucky enough um, to grow up with. Um, seeing it and, and having it sort of modeled around them and seeing what it looks like. And so they're learning in all these sort of disparate ways and there can be, yeah, it can be, it's scary and hard to learn a new thing. And we learn, we learn to learn at school, which is a, you know, sadly, I think a place of evaluation and judgment and kind of a harsh and scary environment for, mm -hmm. for many people. So we're used to being graded and grading ourselves. I think when we, when we learn something new and that actually doesn't help us learn. No. Fear to that. So you're, the chapters, if you will, in the book, it's interesting. And I love how you separate them by good enough when struggling, good enough fun, uh, good enough for other, others. Which section did you find the most rewarding to write? Mm. That is a good question. I think I don't have a strong sense of writing the sections particularly. Particularly, I think some of the essays were very challenging for me to write, like the ones that were really personal. Um, I mean, a lot of it's all very personal, but um, the yeah, I think the ones where I was sharing actually, it's like the mornings one because I'm like, mm -hmm. I'm kind of not a morning person. That one was hard but rewarding um, for me because it really, I really thought. I was like, I'm going to figure out a way to talk about mornings. I'm going to like be okay with mornings. And instead that never happened. And I just, the real learning for me in just writing about was like, I have to be okay that I just, I'm not that happy in the mornings and that's okay. That's like an okay way to be. It's like allowed. And it was just like, Oh, okay. Like that's all that there is to it really that. And I think that's so much of it. It's like, we show up the way we show up with the capacity that we have on a given day. And that is just always good enough. Um, and there's nothing about chiding ourselves or pushing ourselves or judging ourselves for whatever that is that will help us uh, grow or achieve any of the things that we imagine. And so I really feel like I learned that somehow through kind of creating that chapter. And it, it ended up being like a lot of sort of make ahead breakfasts. And mm -hmm. um, one of my favorites is the scrambled eggs that you basically just leave and like let them do their thing. I love it. <laughs> you, didn't I love it. Scrambled, you think you have to be doing it all the time, but it's just a very low heat. Um, you occasionally come back and poke at it just to like make sure everything's okay. But it cooks so slowly sort of in the background and that works so well for me because uh, that allows me to sort of like go slowly and, you know, run around after my daughter if need be, you know, make my coffee, have a shower, those kinds of things as it's cooking and then it's ready for me. And so I think I really embraced my own sort of slow, quiet, um, start to the day sort of personality and, um, and like shared that, um, that through the book and it taught me just, yeah, to, to work to accept myself a little bit more about how I show up. And so, yeah, I kind of thought about like needs of the different times of day and that was and I think that can be applied like I had to talk about myself because that was sort of the only way to go here but I hope that people will relate to it in whatever way works for them like I was thinking recently about how you know dinner time is often it's just it's hard for many many people and someone was saying like yeah that's the time of day when I'm like the lowest energy and I was like yeah, you know, that's so true for so many. Like, mm -hmm. it kind of sucks that, like, that's the biggest sort of uh, pressure time of for food. And it's like we're supposed to, like, 
create something then right but it's like you come home from work you're doing so many things you're like changing modes maybe you have you know kids around there's so much to do and then you're it's just such a huge thing to get yourself to do at like a lower point of energy and i was just thinking about how embracing one's sort of style and reality there could lead to some really helpful changes like you know, embracing like an instant pot or a, or like that kind of a cooking style. And really maybe if you're more of a morning person and that's where your energy lives, then making something um, earlier in the morning and like having it. So it's actually ready at that point for you is totally appropriate. And really like that's, Mm -hmm. I guess that's what I'm, it's a self-care cookbook and it's like a philosophy because it's like just knowing how that food and our meals and our meal pattern doesn't have to look any, it's just there to like support you and your needs, right? right? And so if we can think a little bit outside of, you know, these sorts of standards that maybe grew up with like, oh, you're supposed to do this and you're supposed to eat this then and this then and this then. And it's like, none of those rules are necessary. <laughs> like it's yeah. really important to do what works best for you. And so if dinner is sort of not that, important to it's really about like connecting and needing to eat and needing to like ease into the evening into bed then like making something more in advance more of the time um could serve you so much better and i just like i don't know i wish we would talk about that kind of thing more um rather than always there's such focus on um in the world of like cuisine and culinary it's all about like you should eat this and here's a new and exciting ingredient and all of that's wonderful but it's like what I find time and again, when people reach out to me, it's like, they're looking for like, gosh, how do I like just live my life and not be worried and stressed about food all the time. And um, in my last cookbook, Good and Cheap, I had this section called Stuff on Toast. Yes, (laughs) I love that section. (laughs) Exactly what it sounds like. And it's like, I got so many of the sweetest messages about that section in particular. Um, And I think it's because um, well, I know it's for me, it's like, it's validating. It's like, oh, right. It's okay to just eat stuff on toast sometimes. And even, um, not even sometimes, like eat as much as you want. It's a right. valid meal form. I remember this particularly touching email from this one woman who was like, you know, I haven't had much, you know, I've been freelancing, don't have much money and you know, living with roommates. It's really hard sometimes to eat, you know, sort of what I would think of as proper dinners and, when I saw that you had the stuff on toast section, that's how I like to eat. And I've always just felt guilty and bad about it. And you made me realize that it's a good way to eat and there's nothing wrong with it. And it's just like, it's such a simple thing, but that really means so much to me to just be able to, if that like thought that was causing guilt and whatever, sort of just a small amount of pain could sort of just be lessened through that. Like, Yes. You know, like let the message just be out to everyone, like that there is no such thing as sort of the wrong meal. Another, um, my sister-in-law wrote to me recently because she got her copy of Good Enough a while ago. And she sent me this cute little message that was um, a picture of her cutting board and some like minute rice, some microwave rice and like some little things of leftovers. And she was, she was like, no, today I just made a sort of cobbled together leftovers meal. And before reading this, I would have felt kind of embarrassed and like, this is not like a good meal to have. But instead, because I I knew that it was good enough, I actually noticed it was tasty too. It was like, <laughs> it worked so great. And you know what, I put all these things together and I felt proud of the way I was using up these leftovers. And, and like, that's so much like when we focus so much on like, there's a right kind of meal and a wrong kind of meal. Mm-hmm. It's like we miss that sometimes in these moments, the things that we can just cobble together for our own needs are fabulous. Um, and even like something to be proud of. And even if they're not, and again, even if they're not so tasty, I do think that there is real pleasure and maybe it's not as obvious a pleasure, but there's a real pleasure in that feeling of using up something. <laughs> you have Like I get true pleasure out of like, oh yeah. I use the weird little like <laughs> thing of tomato paste in this thing in a smart way. I feel so cool. Like I get genuine like pleasure out of those sorts of moments. I feel efficient and like I'm like in tune with the earth. And like I love to, you know, find little ways to not waste and 
it feels good. It feels true. It feels life affirming. And there are so many of those types of experiences, which are, which I think so many people are having actually all the time, but they're not noticing them or affirming them for themselves. So they're feeling like they're not doing well when they usually are. Like, that's my favorite thing to do is to just be like, you have nothing to worry about. You're doing great already. If you want to learn how to make sourdough bread, go for it. But you're doing great. You know, like whatever it is. It's sort of like, I'm a bad cook. It's like, you're really probably not. You're probably a cook who maybe has really high standards for themselves or, and wants to, you know, and has ambitions, which is a beautiful thing to have, but you're probably doing just fine. Yes, you had mentioned that in your in your book, uh, you know, it is about what is it, ninety percent being fed, and the ten percent is just nice to have. Yeah. <laughs> nice to have. I yeah. love that. That's and my favorite part of the book. Um, I love the luxury water, which I I made myself some Yay! luxury water. I love that. Simple is good, but I I also love the section assembly only, where it just mm. like we were just talking about those zero effort foods where you're just putting some hummus and carrots on a plate and um, to me those are the best <laughs> they're just simple and like you said nourishing your body and giving you pleasure and oh, I, I just really enjoyed that section and I've never felt so seen before um, <laughs> so I, I appreciate that so what what would be your advice to someone who's really struggling whether that be you know, financially, or obviously during this pandemic, we're going through all sorts of different, you know, emotions and each person has their, you know, own struggles. What would you say to them? Um, and maybe this person was responsible for feeding a family. I think I would just say, first, I would want to say to whatever they're going through, that that is real and it's very important um, and to acknowledge whatever that is, if it's, you know, grief or depression or um, just a huge, you know, the pressure of looking after a family during really uncertain times is like, I guess like the first thing I'd say is like, just let that be, this is really hard. What you're doing is hard. Like it's not, you can't approach something like that sort of going like, oh, I should be better at this, you know? It's like, no one's good at that. That's really hard. Um, so that's what I would first say is it's so important to validate ourselves with and not minimize our struggles. I think that's such a, it's it's a coping mechanism. And it's a, often a good one where we're, we kind of go, we minimize often our own pain or our own experiences by saying like, well, but you know, it's not as bad as somebody else has. And it's like, that may be true, but, and, and like, and good and like appropriate for us to have that awareness. I think it is so important to have that awareness, but we can't use it like as a cudgel to kind of go like, don't feel bad. Like to put the, whatever the feeling is, it's like, you're not allowed to have that feeling because someone else is at worst, throw it out the window. It's like, it doesn't go there. Right. It stays. So the first thing I would just acknowledge that that's really hard. It has been hard um, and it's okay to feel that. It's really okay to feel that. And then, yeah. And then in terms of, I guess I would be curious to know more about what they're struggling with. Um, but like, I think it's really like about finding your own cooking. Like, it, like say they're struggling to just meals on the table more frequently i would say like do less like mm -hmm. simplify um when we simplify like in terms of you know make things with you know five to ten ingredients sort of max every time like think about it that way i think that's a really great way to save money if that's an issue and also to sort of be cognitively more simple um and it can allow you also to get more help um from others and then i would say if you are in a position where you're feeding a number of people, depending on the ages of people um, in the house, I would say to try to make it more of a teamwork situation. And to and sometimes that takes a lot of um, courage um, to sort of ask for that, uh, for teamwork, um, for something, because 
even though it can feel like, oh, I don't want to do it all myself, it can almost feel harder to ask others to really help because you can feel like um, you're losing out on getting to do that caring work, which maybe is part of your identity and that can be hard. But that sharing the load, not only it's not, think of it less for you and think more about actually the gift that it actually is for everyone else in the family because if everyone can kind of share the experience and, you know, talking about like maybe one person does a shopping, one person um, or, you know, kids sort of make choices about which meals are when, you know, with some limitation, maybe saying like, you know, it has to have vegetables in it. <laughs> it has right. to have or something like that. Um, so it's not just like, okay, we're doing mac and cheese every single night. Right. But, um, but sort of having, you know, kids make choices. Um, kids do some advanced prep or kids do like there are different ways of creating teamwork. And then each meal, it's it actually creates this beautiful situation where the meal then becomes like a team sport, like where you're like, yeah, high five. We all did this together. And it's like there isn't that sense of judgment and criticism that can sometimes occur. And that can, I think, be really painful for people where if one person is in charge of doing it all and then they're put sitting it down in front of others there's this moment of sort of evaluation like do you like it is it okay and it's like well even if some members of the family don't like it and others do it doesn't really matter because everyone has been in it together and, and i think there's often especially with kids there's like a sense of pride that's fostered through mm -hmm. all of it sort of together and less likely of criticism I know like with my daughter she will often pretend to like something that she's made <laughs> for a couple bites <laughs> even if she very clearly is like not into it because it, you know, she's still sort of in that age where she rejects a lot of food but um yeah so I think creating more uh, just like family rituals around it in small ways and keeping things simple and just validating like just do things your way and the way that works for your family and don't hold yourself to like sort of these outside standards. I think that's really like the shift that can bring a lot of, of freedom and um, yeah. And then, and yeah, just like be kind to yourself. Like think of, I don't know if it helps anyway, think of like, what would I say to you? Like, I wouldn't be mean to you, please like <laughs> be encouraging of yourself in that situation. Mm. Uh, I want to thank both of you for this incredible conversation. I hate to interrupt, um, but I want to make sure that we have time for the audience Q&A as well. Oh, that'd be lovely. Um, this has just been brilliant. Rachel, I really enjoyed the rapid fire questions. <laughs> yeah, that was but fun. <laughs> Martha is like, I, I, I was like, I wish you'd just turn this off because if Martha <laughs> ever catches wind of this. I know, right? Like, I can't be a part of it because I love Martha Stewart. <laughs> Um, so I would just like it to be known when Martha eventually watches. You were on her side. Okay. Yeah. You're and Martha? Like right under the bus. Um, fair. Fair enough. I actually, I made a pie. Not a very good, like, it was good enough is what this pie I bet was. it was. Um, and I posted on Facebook, like, tell Martha I'm coming. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Coming for her crown. Yeah. Um, it was a leftover pie shell that just needed to be used. And so I became inspired to basically create a recipe out of nothing. And uh, it was- I love that. What was in it? Um, I used frozen blueberries and frozen tart cherries Ooh. to make a homemade pie filling and a cracked uh, pie crust and an uncracked pie, pie crust pre-made uh, that had been taking up room in the freezer. So. so you like, you crumbled the cracked one on top? I sure did. Yeah. Clever. See, this is mm -hmm. like, the this is what I was saying. Like, there's something so fun about those moments where you're like, look at me, I made up my own thing. Like, even if it's not like, yeah, sure. Maybe, maybe Martha Stewart wouldn't totally approve. Who knows? But like, that's so wonderful and clever and fun. And you had a good time doing it. And I bet it tasted great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and I also wanted to, based on the last uh, little bit of conversation, um, at one of our earlier uh, virtual events that we did, which really helped inspire me through the pandemic. The pandemic has completely changed the way I look at cooking, the way I look at food, um, the joy that I get. I found out I was a midnight baker, uh, which <laughs> who knew before yes. the pandemic? I love baking cookies at midnight. 
Um, but one of the previous uh, cookbook author, fantastic, basically her inspiration and theory is you spent all this time making this incredible food and whoever is eating it with you, it is a gift to them. Yeah. So don't show up and say, I'm sorry. Like, yes. it didn't turn out the way I wanted it to because mm -hmm. it turned out to be food that is being presented and being always. given to someone. Yeah, else. there's always so much love in that. And I think that, I don't know, I was talking to another friend uh, who also sort of works in food and we were both kind of talking about how when it come that we're both like not very picky when it comes to like I will eat you know if my daughter doesn't eat like a bunch of stuff on her plate there's like scraggly bits so I'll just be like doo, 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 doo. it goes down the hatch whereas like my husband doesn't he's like more discerning about the food that he puts in himself <laughs> it's like fair enough <laughs> this is fine but we were both thinking about it and it was like I think it's because we know like so deeply like how much goes into anything any food that is made and prepared by someone or even that is just grown and you bought somewhere it's like it has so much value like it's so much effort and love and care that goes into just food existing and coming to us in some way or another that i just like can't abide um it being sort of wasted in any way it like doesn't feel okay to me and so it's like yeah and there's something yeah so much about what you said shane is there too that yeah it's so much anytime we make something for ourselves or for for others it's like it absolutely is a gift it's a gift of your time and your energy um and your creativity and your taste frankly like that you picked why that one why did you want to share that with that particular person it says something about your relationship and there's so much um beauty there and then yeah when we do that thing that is so normalized where we kind of go like oh you know it didn't turn out this exact way so i'm sorry it's like I think what we're doing is kind of, I don't know, I've done that so many times. I've, it's like a habit I've tried to stop. It's like a way of stopping the connection almost from happening. Cause it's like a little hard. I think sometimes like I know to me, cooking is such a love language. It's the way that I absolutely express my love for people. I remember one time years ago, I made these special cookies for a friend of mine and I like made up the whole recipe. It was like using really unusual flavors that she particularly liked. And the they were such like delicate biscuit cookies that they kind of fell apart in the tin a little bit, which, and it was fine. But I remember just like apologizing inordinately to her about like how, oh, they've fallen apart. I'm like, oh, I've done all this and blah. Um, and I just, yeah, and it's okay, but I wish that I hadn't done that because they were, of course, so clearly and like super lovingly made. But I just, it's almost like in the moment, I couldn't handle how much I loved her and like needed to show it to her. So I had to like make it be a little off somehow so that I could like calm down or something. Um, yeah. Uh, we do have at least one question from the audience, and I want to remind the audience watching to type up any questions that you might have or comments. Right. Like I, uh, I'm going to share a story if we have time about uh, one of my experiences making one of your recipes. Um, do. But I want to also remind everyone watching that Rachel's is joining us from the incredible organization Operation Food Search. And for every copy of Good Enough that is purchased from Left Bank Books in this calendar year, 2022, every copy purchased, a copy of Good and Cheap will be donated to Operation Food Search for nutritional programming and education. And um, Rachel, do you want to tell us just maybe a tiny bit more yes, about <laughs> what, what they are giving this book to? Yeah, sure. So we, uh, you know, do nutrition education classes within our partner agencies. So that could look like a, um, you know, food bank or a after school program or most recently um, a safe house for women. And after they go through a cooking class with us, they receive Leanne's cookbook and it is very well received um, from our participants and they very much appreciate it and we've gotten some feedback that you know they are going to start using it and um so that's one of the ways that we use that do book you do those content. classes rachel i do with a colleague of mine yes yeah sometimes virtually as a yeah. moment yeah but yes 
So anywhere from kids to all the way up to seniors, we work with anyone that needs um, a little bit of help. That's wonderful. All right, let's get to a couple of the questions from the audience members. Jocelyn asks, what's a good way to teach these principles about good enough to our kids? Hmm. I, well, I think modeling them, to be honest, is probably the first thing. Um, so really to begin to sort of take them into yourself. And um, I think that we naturally are going to be, well, hopefully I think we're all a little bit more naturally forgiving um, of our children and their sort of mistakes and their, um, their ways of operating in the kitchen if you invite them in. But I think that the thing is we know about kids, like they learn much more from seeing what, what we do um, than the way even that you treat them. Like it is, of course, the way you treat them matters enormously, but they are always watching you for the way that you act and the way that you treat yourself. So I think modeling it is really important. And then the other thing I would say is I always try to, when I have Io, my daughter in with me, I try basically when we cook together, I just try to go like, okay, we're slowing down. We're going, we're kind of simplifying. And so I always try to, I know that like, for me, you know, she's messy. She'll be like messy with it all. And at first I remember just being like, wow, it's like, ugh, bums me out. Like how messy things get. And I don't, I don't want it to be messy. And, and I just had to sort of like be with myself and say like, well, what's more important really? Do we want to be for everything to be clean and to not have to mess this up, clean up this mess? Or do I want her to like be here with me, like learning this and enjoying this food? And so I try to notice, and there are times where it's like, I'm in a rush or I'm trying to get something done. I just go like, okay, I'm, not, I'm just going to not invite her to cook with me right now because that's my sort of boundary, like my limitation. And I don't want to invite her in and then be like, no, don't touch that. Bah! So I think knowing when you can be like, have them be a part of cooking and when you can't is really important. Um, and then, yeah, the other thing is then when I let her in with me, we also kind of, I listen to and allow like her super weird ideas, <laughs> you know? And I let her like taste as we go. Like she tastes absolutely everything, even raw cinnamon on one unfortunate occasion. She loves to eat absolutely everything. And I think that that's probably like a really good thing. Um, even if sometimes I'm like, ugh, why are there squirrel-like fingerprints in the butter? Well, I know the reason. Um, and then, yeah, and then in addition, like if she has sort of an unusual idea or she's like, let's put lemon on that or whatever, I'm like, yeah, let's do it. And um, so really making it, I think, a, and I have the luxury, I have one kid, and so we can really connect and um, enjoy the experience together but we try to just do, I try to just bring her in anytime I'm doing things in the kitchen. It's like a thing that we connect over. So I think that helps. And yeah, and then just in our reaction, like yesterday I burnt a quesadilla because we were like doing a bunch of things at once and we like talked about it and we tried to like scrape part of it off and it was just like way, way, way too black. The whole th like outside was absolutely horribly charred. So I was like, okay, well, what do you think we can do? And so we scraped like the cheese out of the inside and like made another one. And um, yeah, I think it's just like, they look to us to see how we're going to react. And I think when we are able to be less bothered by small mistakes, um, especially the ones we make, um, not so much the ones they make, um, then they'll be able to take that in. Hannah asks, what would you say to someone who is being hard on themselves for eating for comfort? I would say that is the most natural thing in the world, um, the most human thing in the world to eat for comfort. Um, and that comfort food really has sort of a bad, a bad rap. Um, a, you know, we think like, first off, I, I think I have a, I have an essay in the book about redefining comfort food because comfort food doesn't have to mean like, burgers and mac and cheese and these sorts of things that we've decided are comfort food. Comfort food means food that literally makes you feel comforted. And so that may have to do with like your family background or your experiences, um, the foods that make you feel good when with what you need. And so I think that the thing about comfort food is it's 
totally okay to do it. I think the, it really, really is. It's, it's more than okay um, to eat for comfort. I think just it's something we want to have a balance about where we notice in our bodies when it stops being comforting and it starts to make us feel ill. Cause that's just, I think that's what often gets conflated is this idea of like, well, you're comforting yourself too much and you're going to, you know, and it's like, no, if you're truly just comforting yourself, that's like wonderful. Good, good for you. I'm so glad that we all have this tool. Food is this wonderful thing that we have at our disposal. You know, if we're lucky, those of us who are like food secure and are able to have food to bring us comfort. Wonderful. I think it's just that we don't want to get so kind of out of our body with distress that we are eating and eating to the point where we're not feeling good in our bodies anymore. And then it's not really comforting us, is it? So I think it's just, yeah, it's just about like finding that balance where you are actually eating to comfort yourself and not beyond that, um, which can hurt you, yeah. which we, and we never want to eat food to hurt ourselves, of course, but that can be hard. Um, but yeah, if you have that message that like, this is bad for me, while you're trying to comfort yourself, it's going to be harder also to feel that comfort too, right? So I would say, allow it to be comforting and know that that's a good thing that you're doing for yourself. Just like, you know, a parent holding their child and feeding them milk when they're crying is comforting them with food and is absolutely, mm -hmm. totally appropriate. I'm going to leave us with one comment and then I'll tell you. I'll save my story uh, for after we go. After we go. <laughs> it deals with your deviled food uh, recipe from Good, Good and Cheap. Oh, okay. Which I, is a delightful, like, if you if anyone watching doesn't have a copy of Good and Cheap, like, you need a copy of Good and Cheap. You need a copy of Good Enough. You need a copy of Good and Cheap. These are two incredible cookbooks. Um, the dot says, so glad to be here. I'm cooking garlic, lemon, butter, smashed potatoes as I watch. Which mm. really um, yes. uh, Leanne, I wish our paths would have crossed earlier when my kids were young. Keep on keeping on. Oh, like that's such you. a fantastic note. <laughs> uh, but I do want to remind the audience, A, thank you so much for being here tonight. It is really incredible that we are Still have people showing up to virtual events two years after the fact. And yeah, it's not lost on me. Thank you all so much. Seriously. I shared a link for how to get a copy of Good Enough, signed edition from Left Bank Books. Leanne was so wonderful to send us signed book plates that are available for all of our, uh, for both Good Enough and Good and Cheap purchased from Left Bank Books. For every copy of Good Enough purchased from Left Bank Books, a wonderful copy of Good and Cheap will be donated to Operation Food Search for the entire year of 2022 uh, to uh, help Rachel with the nutritional program that she is so incredible to lead in the St. Louis area. So this was just such a fantastic event. I'm thrilled to have had this opportunity with both of you, and I hope that you had as much fun as I did. <laughs> Loved it. This was so warm and lovely and just so nice to meet you and get a chance to connect Rachel and Jane. Loved yes. it. My pleasure. <laughs> All right. And to the audience watching, we will see you again really soon. Have a great rest of your evening. Bye, everyone. Stay warm. <laughs>